Hello everyone and welcome to the second of the week's lectures on medieval European sexualities. In our discussions thus far, we've talked about the origins of the concept of courtly love. We've learned about how the Gregorian church reforms of the 11th century served as a stimulus to the creation of a new sexual ideology in which physical love was seen not as something sinful and immoral, but instead as something holy, spiritual, and pure. We've learned about how these new courtly ideas of true love were spread through song and verse. We've talked about the extent to which this romantic ideology is still with us today, and in connection with this, you may be wondering, is this where our modern concept of heterosexuality comes from? Given that the sexual partners in this new courtly relationship ideal were adult men and women, should we understand courtly love as a heterosexual phenomenon? Or were the desires and behaviors embodied in Fiends d'Amour something other than heterosexuality? Scholarly discussions of courtly love often present this as a version of heterosexuality. Indeed, if you read through academic publications on this subject, you will sometimes read the word heterosexual appearing quite frequently in connection with the subject of medieval European romance. Despite this, I want to caution against the use of this term. To be sure, in some ways, courtly love is like modern-day heterosexuality. Like modern-day heterosexuality, courtly love was the central, authorized, hegemonic, official, and quote-unquote normal form of sexuality in Europe's Middle Ages. It was the standard, the default, the thing against which all other forms of sexual desire and all other kinds of sexual relationships were measured. However, despite the fact that it was conventional and mainstream, in some rather important ways, courtly love is not heterosexual in the modern sense. Before getting into what exactly makes courtly love something other than heterosexuality, let me just quickly remind us all first that the modern system of sexuality we're living with now is rooted in the idea of sexual object choice. We classify ourselves sexually today in terms of the gender of the people who we desire. So, for example, if I, a man, desire other men, I'm homosexual. If I, a man, desire women, I'm heterosexual. But this is not how people in the Middle Ages classified themselves. How did they classify themselves? For some insights on this, I'd like to turn to the writings of Thomas Aquinas a 13th century theologian who wrote extensively on religion and sex. In his writings, Aquinas put forward a kind of continuum of sexual behavior. The three main points along this were virginity, marriage, and fornication. For him, as for lots of Christian theorists at the time, abstinence was the most preferable form of sexual inactivity. All venereal acts were thought to bring some kind of danger. Next best, after abstinence, were those acts that, according to Aquinas, respected reason and nature. For example, the union of husband and wife desiring children. Worse than these were those acts that violated reason, which is to say, that were outside the bounds of matrimony. These included fornication, rape, adultery, sodomy, bestiality, and masturbation. Looking at these three points along Aquinas' spectrum, we might be tempted to say that he elevates heterosexuality over homosexuality, because sex between men and women inside the bonds of marriage is better than sodomy, according to him. However, look what else Aquinas lists under the very worst kind of sex, rape, which can be perpetrated by men or women upon either sex, adultery, which obviously can be heterosexual, and masturbation, which is something both homosexuals and heterosexuals do. From this, it is clear that Aquinas' sexual hierarchy is very much unlike our own. 
As evidence of this, we could also point out that for Aquinas, oral sex and masturbation are worse than rape, since the latter can lead to conception and childbirth. Looking at this schema, we ought best concede the words of historian Arnold Davidson, who writes that, quote, If we perpetually look for precursors to our own categories of sexuality and essentially different domains, we will produce anachronisms at best and unintelligibility at worst. Again, heterosexual acts are not grouped together in Aquinas' list. Clearly, the criteria by which they were understood, which by which we can understand intimate relations, are different than our own. Thus, we should resist the urge to talk about these people as if they were, quote-unquote, heterosexual. Doing this clamps down on the present and colonizes the past. We should also realize that people in the Middle Ages had no concept of sexual orientation. People did not think of themselves as being attracted to one gender or another. In exploring this argument a bit more, I'd like to talk about another epic medieval romance, the story of Parsifal. Written in the 13th century by the uh, German poet Wolfram von Essenbach, Parsifal is an enormous text. It consists of 16 different books and has a greater scope than any other medieval literary work aside from maybe Dante's Divine Comedy. I don't have time here to go into all of the details of the plot, but the story is essentially about an Arthurian hero who goes on a quest for the Holy Grail, which in this story is a magical stone that imparts miraculous powers of happiness, youth, and prosperity to its owner. Some of the key characters in the story include Gamuret, who is Parsifal's father, Belacane, who is the queen of the African kingdom of Zazamank, uh, whom Gahumet marries and impregnates, only to later abandon, Gurnemans, who teaches Parsifal how to be a knight, and Kondwarimers, the queen of the city of Pelopier, whom Parsifal rescues and then later marries. The story ends with Parsifal becoming the king of the Grail and reuniting with his wife. This story was immensely popular in medieval Europe. It was translated into many different languages and in 1882 was made into an opera by the German composer Richard Wagner. One of the things that makes the legend of Parsifal such great material for historians of sexuality is that it is filled with romantic intrigue, with declarations of love, with songs about beauty and sexual desire, and with scenes of physical intimacy. And interestingly, when reading through the text, one of the first things that we notice is that male and female characters are often described in very similar ways. The physical features that make the bodies of men and women attractive are often identical. For example, throughout the story, both Parsifal and Quandwiramurs are described as individuals with radiant complexions and red lips. The beauty of Quandwiramurs is said to be like the rose, covered with sweet dew when it opens out of the bud sheath revealing precious, fresh radiance. Similarly, the character of Renevart is described as such. His radiant beauty was like a dewy rosebud when its rough sheath opens up. Later on in the story, Parsifal runs into a group of women who were, quote, tormented by the thought of his lips that were so red. What is interesting about this is that the sexually alluring features of male and female bodies are basically interchangeable. Courtly bodies, in other words, are not marked by sex. Beauty standards for men and women are the same. This is not how we think about things today. Today, the desires associated with heterosexual love are stirred by difference, not sameness. Today, we expect bodies to declare their sex, as our entire system of classifying sexual desires depends on this knowledge. Indeed, today, you cannot tell if desire is heterosexual or homosexual unless you know the sex of the bodies involved. 
Courtly love is very different. Rather than being stimulated by ideas of sex difference, desire operates here under a rubric of sameness. What often attracts lovers to each other is their clothing. And in the 13th century, European fashions were incredibly unisex. Women and men wore many of the same basic garments, including a hemmed, which is basically a shirt, a roque or a robe, and a mantle or a cloak. Furthermore, both men and women valued costly fabrics that were ornamented with jewels and beads. The only real difference in clothing was that women's garments tended to fall to the floor, whereas those of men tended to expose the area just below the knees. Clothes proclaimed wealth and fame, and they stimulated desire in the eyes of the beloved. Consider a passage in which Gamuret, Parsifal's father, is summoned to court. It reads, Princely garments were quick, quickly brought to him, which he put on. I heard tell that they were costly. Heavy anchors of Arabian gold graced the garments as he wished. Another thing that makes courtly love different than heterosexuality is its explanation of where desire comes from. Today, we tend to believe that sexuality is something that comes from inside us. We talk about sexuality in terms of urges and instincts and drives, and in terms of the internal biological stuff inside us, like our genes and our hormones. In other words, modern sexuality is based on the idea that we have these interior impulses. We have libidos that rise and fall in natural cycles and that make us horny. All of this is alien to medieval understandings of love between adult men and women. Courtly love was not something that originated in the lover. It originates outside us. It emerges only when a knight or somebody else unexpectedly gazes upon someone whose appearance steals their heart and strikes them down with love. Courtly love enters the body through the eyes. Consider a passage from Parsifal when Gamuret rides up to Belican's palace. It reads, The eyes of the mighty queen caused her great pain when she saw the Angevin, that is, Gahumuret. His appearance was so suitable for love that he unlocked her heart completely, whether she liked it or not. A final difference between courtly love and heterosexuality has to do with the kinds of acts and practices that impart a sense of pleasure, well-being, and satisfaction. In medieval romances like Parsifal, courtly lovers routinely withhold their embraces from the people they love, not so much out of respect, but in defiance of what their lovers actually want. They do this, especially men do this, because for them, courtly love is all about self-control and restraint. That is where the pleasure comes from. In other words, you get distinction from abstinence. When Parsifal and Kanwiramurs sleep together for the first time, Parsifal is described as a faithful, constant man who always has demonstrated appropriate restraint. He continues to show this restraint even when lying next to his wife in bed, refusing to touch her and saying that, if I were to now want too much, disloyalty would be acting for me. Here, there's no glory for those who give in to their desires. Instead, satisfaction comes from mastering oneself, from imposing restraints on oneself. And for courtly lovers, this is not difficult. One does not have to wrestle with one's longings. One does not have to struggle to contain one's desires. This produces no inner turmoil. In courtly love, love is under control. It is effortlessly and naturally subordinated to service. And this, again, is where pleasure comes from. All right, so that's all I've got for now. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. Once you've had time to think about things a bit, please head over to the discussion board and address the following questions. What makes courtly love different than heterosexuality? Does the existence of courtly love, this tradition, suggest that heterosexuality is unnatural? Or, in other words, that it's a historical construct? And does the way that sexual desire and behavior were structured in medieval romances still have relevance for us today? If so, how? 
Looking forward to seeing you on the discussion board. Until later, bye-bye.